Taniguchi's golden corn has got to be the most fascinating koi to be developed over the last 30 years. There's so much going on with just this one fish. I had to, I had to make a video and just break it all down for you. Hello everyone. I'm Sean. I'm a passionate koi expert and I run Mystic Koi out in Southern California. Today, we're going to dive into the crazy world that is koi and more specifically uh, talk about a relatively new and what I think is an incredible koi variety that took about 15 years to make. Some people love them, others aren't quite sold on them. I mean, at least until they watch this video, hopefully, right? And that koi I'm talking about, if you haven't figured it out by the title of this video, is the golden corn. It's a unique creation from Taniguchi Koi Farm out in Hiroshima, Japan. Personally, I love these koi, and I'm gonna break down all the reasons for you why I think they're awesome. So, first and foremost, Let's address the elephant that's in the room. They look like corn on the cob. Like, it just immediately pops out and grabs your attention. It's, it's gotta be one of the best names for koi. tanaguchi san just completely nailed it. When I see this, this is a giant vegetable swimming around my pond. Second, one thing that makes the golden corn so special is how they evolve over time. So from the early days as a tiny tosai, which is a koi that's less than a year old, to their full grown potential, which can be 85, 88, 90 cm, the transformation they undergo is just amazing. I ask for you guys to show me a koi that can change from a little kigoi or a little shiromuji, that's like a yellow or a white fish, uh, that all and generally, so if you had like 30 of them, like 25 of them are gonna consistently change into something completely different than they started. Thirdly, Tanaguchi, he's just a mastermind behind this variety. So he did such an awesome job with the genetics of golden corn. He started with bloodlines using koi that have potential to grow big and do so at a really quick rate. So many other koi breeders, when trying to refine their fish, begin the inbreeding process or start choosing fish that can't really grow but have a nice pattern, for example. And then finally, uh, before we kind of explore these different types of koi, because believe it or not, the golden corn aren't all golden, uh, <laughs> I want to share with you my own three-year project that I've been kind of working on to better understand how these koi change. So for now, Let's kind of delve into the world of Mr. Yoichi Taniguchi and his quest to create something truly unique in the koi world. You see, Taniguchi-san, he's not just a koi breeder. The guy's an innovator. He's a first-generation koi breeder, which is already kind of rare, but it kind of forced him to sort of pave his own way through the industry. Um, for example, in his business model, he only sells tosai. Uh, that's little fish. That means like if you want a jumbo koi from Taniguchi Koi Farm, you're gonna have to raise it on your own or put it under his care and he'll help you grow it. But you still gotta start with that early stage. He's super famous for breeding Gosonke, which is Koaku Sonke specifically. Uh, and his koi every single year just win a ton of awards all over Japan at all the different koi shows. I happen to be fortunate enough to be the first U.S. koi dealer ever to buy his koi. So he and I kind of have a unique relationship in that sense and I'm able to get a lot of firsthand like insight on different things that are going around Taniguchi's koi farm, including the birth of the golden corn. You see, while Taniguchi has like a deep love for Kohaku and Sanke, of course, he has a huge appreciation for Ginrin varieties and like unusual stuff. And so because of that, every year he kind of embarks on an experimental breeding program. Uh, usually he's trying to create something different like an Goshiki or a Yamabuki Ogan. One year he made some Karasugoi. Around 2008, one of these experiments involved this massive female Chagoi that was over a meter. 
he bred that with a male Ginrin Asagi. And among those offsprings, he discovered a Ginrin Sauragoid that he thought was rad. It had a really good body, and the gray wasn't just a flat gray. It had sort of that complexity that Asagi does. Um, so he takes this koi, female, and breeds it with another male Asagi in a different project he's working on hoping to introduce the sort of red speckling known as Kanako. Quick editing note here, guys. I I noticed I completely butchered the pronunciation of that. It should be Kanoko, not Kanako. Kanoko. Kanoko. Okay, back to the video. On each scale, Kanako is this really unique feature that usually is found in really old bloodlines of Kohaku. Uh, Kanako is this like speckling uh, that resembles that of like a fawn or like a baby deer. So anyways, he chose this Asagi because this particular one had a ton of orange on the upper part of the body and he was hoping to sort of recreate some of that dappling across, across it. Well, simultaneously, Taniguchi is working on another experiment involving Karashi and Benigoy. And the result of this was a Karashi male, which he then bred with a female Genrin Asagi from that Kanako group I mentioned. And this, my friends, is how we get the first golden corn. So it's kind of important to understand that each of these experiments, they take years to get any results. Like female koi can't even spawn until they're at least three years old, right? And uh, anything could happen during that time, you know, typhoons, bad weather, uh, egrets, cranes, a mix up in water quality, all sorts of things can influence the outcome. So in total, it took four generations starting from that one meter chagoy to create the golden corn. I asked Tanaguchi san what his favorite aspect of the golden corn is. And he kind of pointed two main two main things. Uh, first, obviously, they grow massive, and that's due to that Karashi and Chagoy bloodline. Secondly, the offspring come in like a ton of different styles. There's Ginrin, there's non-Ginrin, there's Golden, and there's Silver, and then there's all sorts of other weird stuff that comes from breeding them. So I want to kind of explore the different kinds of golden corn and show you how crazy their transformation process is. So let's begin with this koi. It's a Tosai. It's from that fourth generation spawning I mentioned earlier. And this photo was taken in October. When it was measured, it was around 15 centimeters. It's about six inches. And at this stage, the yellow isn't particularly prominent in any way. And there's kind of random white spots on the side of the body. Fast forward four months later, Taniguchi decides to showcase this koi at the All Japan Koi Show in one of his green ponds. Yeah, the All Japan Koi Show, the biggest koi show in the whole world. And what does it look like? Take a look. So yeah, I guess it's, it's grown 10 centimeters and that was just over four really cold months and that's kind of impressive. But honestly, it's not very captivating. Uh, the white spots disappeared on it, and uh, that vibrant yellow uh, now has a bunch of black speckles all over the whole body. So Taniguchi takes this koi home, nurtures it for another year, and it reaches 50 centimeters, 19 inches, and something truly extraordinary comes out. This koi is just incredible. And by 2020, the scales, you notice, even darken up more, and it just leads this absolutely stunning koi. He takes it back to the All Japan Koi Show, not as a display koi this time, but as a competitor. And to absolutely no one's surprise whatsoever, it's awarded the prestigious 65 Boo Botan Prize. And this little yellow koi that we started, started with, yeah, that's the same koi from the very beginning of the video. Oh, but wait, there's there's more. In 2017, Taniguchi organized a grow-out contest among 
some local hobbyist with his gosanke. And one of those hobbyists, kind of as a joke, um, picked this koi in a different nearby tank that had some of the golden corn in it, right? And as you can see, this koi is a Shiro Muji. There's no color, there's no pattern, there's nothing to write home about at all on this fish. I guess the white is okay. Um, bleh. Yeah, so Tanaguchi agrees. Um, and that's, to be honest with you, the only reason we actually have a picture of this fish is because all the koi had pictures for the grow out contest. And uh, three years later, yeah, there's this behemoth measuring 88 centimeters. Look at it. The, the color development is astounding. It's it's just insane. And like what to me is really, really cool is how the skin remained that pristine white the entire time, but the scales took on that reddish brown tint all over them. Um, for me also, this koi is a really great study piece to talk to people about what fukrin or what skin is, understanding the difference between skin and scales. Because as a distinction, you can see the white area like around each scale, that skin, and then that brown part is a scale. It's really, really impressive. Here are a couple more examples showcasing that sort of crazy transformation I'm talking about. If you look at both these Ginrin silver type, I call them silver type, over the course of three years, they developed just this beautiful Kanako pattern throughout its entire body. I also, I really like this one. It has this kind of yellowish hue, uh, which is a different kind of color than we see in some of the others. And if you notice, it has this just really striking Asagi scale issue. The reticulation of each scale is super, super pronounced, which is awesome. So after like witnessing all the remarkable journeys that these golden corn go through, um, I couldn't stop myself. I had to like join in on the adventure. So as a devoted scholar of all things Koi and being fortunate enough to have a really great relationship with Tanaguchi-san, I was able to acquire 15 high quality golden corn and I have documented their changes each year. So my ultimate goal at the end of the day is just to try to get one really, really, really good specimen that's hopefully good enough for the All Japan Koi Show. Uh, but along the way, I'll learn something about each piece. And I'm hoping to put this all together and kind of share that journey with you guys for another video, hopefully soon. Thanks for indulging me in this sort of passionate discussion about Koi. I really hope uh, you come to maybe not fall in love with uh, corn. It's great if you do, but at least respect where they've come from and why they are such a unique and different sort of fish. I'm Sean McHenry. I operate Mystic Koi and Water Gardens in Southern California. Have an awesome week. And remember the best way to learn about koi is just spending quality time watching your own koi, watching them change and seeing what they do. Thanks so much. Take care.